and you have cared for us, you have provided for us, you have given us hearts willing to love you and to serve you, you have given us minds that are keen to understand your word and your purposes for our lives, you have also <coughs> put within us a desire to help others, a desire to minister the graces of Christ to those that are struggling, to those caught up in, in this present evil age and who struggle to find themselves um, <coughs> resting in the graces of Christ. So Father, we, we pray that as we continue to work and read and reflect and consider and, and meditate on these things, that you will encourage our hearts and, and you will teach us and, and give us the wisdom that we need in order to be people that can be instruments in your hands, people that you can use with great usefulness and blessing in the body of Christ. We pray, Father, that you would so encourage us and so bless us. And we thank you for the term's work we've done uh, these past few weeks and bringing us to this final class. And we pray, Father, that you would continue to cement these things into our lives and into our relationships with one another and our ministries within the body of Christ. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, tonight we have the last of our three lectures on adolescence, and uh, we began with um, conception and uh, birth, infancy, early childhood, middle childhood. Adolescence, uh, young adulthood, middle adulthood, old age, old, old age. So, uh, yes, yes, it's all coming your way. Wherever you find yourself on there, there's more up ahead for you. <laughs> Crisis and transition never stops. It comes relentless like a train crash. You see it come in and you can't stop it. And adolescence is one of those significant transitions which uh, we've spent a bit of time on. And uh, so we're going to round out the term with a final lecture on adolescence between two worlds. In this lecture, we're going to look at the adolescents changing relationship with their parents, um, family of origin. What significant changes are taking place for the adolescent personally, and we've looked at that in the last two weeks, changes are also taking place within the family itself. So if we're um, thinking about the, the adolescent in the family circle, there's, um, there's a father and there's a mother and there's uh, perhaps, say, four siblings and uh, our adolescent is one of them. Now, in the last two weeks, we have been talking about all the changes going on for the adolescent, this one here. You see, and it's a different colour to show that they're kind of no longer meshing in with the family quite the way they were. And as things happen here with the adolescent, so um, things happen within the family as a whole. And, uh, and everyone in the family has to adjust to the adolescent. As the adolescent's relationships in the family change, inevitably, so the whole family has to make adjustments. Now, how well will the family do with making adjustments? 
Uh, that's what we're going to talk about here tonight. And, and you may find yourself in a situation, uh, in a church or pastoral counselling situation, where you, you're talking to some parents, for instance, who, who are evidencing concern about their adolescent child, and, and they're aware of the changes and the disruption, as they describe it, that this adolescent is causing within the family circle. Now, they don't want the adolescent to leave, necessarily. They want the adolescent to stay, but they want the adolescent to somehow moderate their behaviour, their attitudes, uh, because the effect on the family is more disruptive than these other family members are willing to endure. Now, it may be that what you need to do is sit down with the family, with mum and dad and the four children, and have a little family conference and, and talk about what's happening with this one here. And let each family member talk about uh, how they're um, finding it, living in the family with this one, and let this one talk about what it's like for them, you see? And so everyone's talking now about what it's like to be in this family circle with these uh, transitions taking place. Therefore, putting away falsehood, we should speak truthfully one to another, for we are all members of the same body. Here we are, we're all members of the same body, and we're now speaking truthfully to one another, and uh, rather than living a falsehood. So not only are significant changes taking place for the adolescent personally, changes are also taking place in the family itself. Now a child, this is now back here, small, early childhood, middle childhood, <clears throat> a child thinks of the family as being static, always there, always predictable. This is in a good family, in a stable family. The family is always there. And the child, back here, early child, middle childhood, generally speaking, the child doesn't find themselves analysing the family situation. They don't find themselves thinking about, well, how's our family doing? Now, in times of crisis, like if there's a, a divorce here uh, between the parents at this day, suddenly the, the child is suddenly thrust into a situation where they're having to consider the unthinkable, that their family, which they've just always presumed on, is falling apart. But generally speaking, unless it's forced upon the child, children don't actually spend their time thinking about the dynamics of the family, what's going on in the family. Um, they might be aware of disruptions in the family from time to time, but generally speaking for them, the family is a given. It's the, it's the context in which they're enjoying their childhood. Now, when the child moves into adolescence, the adolescent is much more aware of the dynamics going on within the family. As the adolescent finds themselves caught up in the dynamics of the relationship, say, with mum and dad, in a ways that they've never had to before, the adolescent is beginning to is beginning to reevaluate things, see things differently, thinking they're beginning to have a different view of their mother and their father. No longer were their parents the ones who back here just regularly provided the meals and regularly provided whatever clothing and whatever requirements they needed for school and, and always ensured that, you know, they had a bed to sleep in and took care of them and gave them a cuddle when they needed a cuddle and, and, and corrected them when they needed correcting. And the child accepted that. Now as an adolescent, the adolescent is beginning to see their parents in a different light and beginning to see the relationship they have with their parent in a dis different light. This may be influenced by the adolescent's birth order. Now I've got four here, four children here. Is this adolescent number one, number two, number three, or number four? Now if the adolescent is, say, number three or four in the birth order, what effect do you think that might have on their experience of adolescence within the family than, say, on numbers one and two? And what will they have seen and what will they have learnt? Um, all sorts of um, c culture, such as music and, and behaviour and, and things, behavioural differences. 
So what effect does it make that they're third and fourth in the birth order? Well, they, they know a bit about what's out there. Oh, because they've seen it in their older siblings. Mm. Okay, they've heard the rock music coming from their older brother's bedroom. Is yeah. that what you mean? Yeah. So they know it's out there. And, and, and in terms of the relationships within the family, though, in terms of the relationships in the family dynamic, what will number three and four, how will their birth order affect their understanding of the family dynamics and the relationship with the parents? The first one, the, 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 the parents would never have dealt with the adolescent before, so the the oldest one will be kind of like the test case, and so the next okay. the next one, um, they they maybe won't be as as strict, or not, they might be a bit more aware of what an adolescent is. Whereas before, they probably they might have had that assumption that they'll be kind of children forever. So what, what you're saying is that the parents are going to learn some things as they go down the birth order. Mm -hmm. but, but what about the... Sorry, but my question is, what about the adolescent itself? What's the significance for the adolescent that they're number four, not number one, within, as they beginning to understand the dynamics of the family? Well, do they, you know, they might look to their older brothers or sisters for the leadership more than their parents. Well, that's kind of changed. They might transfer their sort of loyalty their siblings more than their parents. Um, they might. Or they might react to it. They didn't like how they saw them mm -hmm. do it and go the opposite. Okay. Yeah, they can gain, sort of take sides of the parents against the one that's causing all the stress, the older one. Okay. So sibling three and four, uh, child three and four, uh, has observed one and two going through the adolescent years. Say they're four or five years younger. They've observed the adolescent going through the teenage years, the adolescent years. And like you said, Mark, they've seen the they've seen the angst between the adolescent and the parents as the parents are grappling with adolescents perhaps for the first time and, and so on and, and not doing a very good job of it. And the younger ones are watching and they're observing. And what are they saying to themselves, the younger ones? Because they see their adolescence coming like a train crash. And they see all the grief here that one and two are having with... You see, what, what's the younger ones saying to themselves? I'm not going to be like that. So I'm going to avoid that. So how are they going to avoid it? Running away from home? <laughs> Probably not. Yeah, strategies like to avoid conflict, maybe. Being people pleasers or... Maybe they'll see other things the older siblings did that they think worked and other things that didn't work. Maybe they'll, if they have a good relationship, they can they just might ask them for advice if they think that the older ones did well. Okay, so a number of things could happen. Number three and four could look at the experience of one and two and say, well, I'm not going to do what they did and get into trouble the way they got into trouble. I saw the way they acted up and I saw the grief that it brought to this family and I'm going to avoid that. I'm not going to do the things that they did. That's one way. And, and that's quite a common way and the way that works itself out is that the parents then, then see the youngest child, for instance, as being, uh, <laughs> you know, the child who, who didn't burst out, who didn't break out, who, who, and, and so the younger child is sometimes favoured and, the, and the, some, the younger child is sometimes pointed to as, well, at least this one didn't cause us all the grief that the older ones did. And, or they, they might, you hear the parent talking to, to other, other people about their family and say, well, look, you know, we had, we had real strife with, with, uh, with these ones, but, you know, the youngest one, she, she or he is just, well, it's just so much easier and, and you know, the parents have learned some things and the kid has learned how to keep out of trouble. See, and maybe, maybe what the youngest one has learned to do is just keep it all inward. Mm -hmm. See, and not break out. Because they've seen the grief it's caused. And, and so they, they uh, get favoured and, 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 and finally, you know, they leave home and, 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 and their, <laughs> their breakout is going to happen down here somewhere. Uh, I had three older brothers. 
And by the time my turn came along for adolescence, I had figured out how to stay out of trouble. Watching the older three, particularly the older two, really come to a lot of grief. As a result, I was my mother's favourite, and she made no bones about that. Talk about a coat of many colours. And of course, uh, the more she favoured me, the more my brothers beat up on me. See, and so, uh, see, the youngest one just figures these things out. And, and so their experience of adolescence is different. So now if the, if the parents were talking about the difficulty of raising adolescents, they, they might focus their conversation on the older ones. Even to this day, my older brothers, who what in their 70s, will still refer to Peter as the favourite one. See, it's just, it's just, they just, well, I thought it was pretty neat. But see, they, they can't get past it. See, and so it's affected our relationship for the rest of our lives. Mm-hmm. So, um, Eden, where do you come? Five. Right in the middle. Okay, so as you watched your older siblings go through adolescence, what little vows or lessons did you come to? You know how to stay out of trouble? Yeah, how to fly to Run off to Africa. <laughs> Marry some crazy Kiwi from the other side of the world. <laughs> you see, you had your own way of breaking out. Yeah, yeah. we were talking about that last week. Uh, Mark, where did you come in your birth order? Trust. Number one? Okay, tell us. <laughs> so, so what was your experience? as being the one they all practiced on, your parents practiced on? No, I, I think um, I tended to try and please and, and I probably all broke out a bit more gradually and more, more later than my peers. You mean after after adolescence? Oh, no, more just maybe the middle. Or, but I didn't really have anything is it still coming? <laughs> but I was interested in how my, uh, I guess I avoided conflict and, and tried to have my little life in the family and it just kind of was one thing. I had, I had friends who used to talk about other stuff but they were just kind of separate. Okay. Um. Just, like for me, it just seemed like there was lots of rules, and all the rules from childhood just kept, kept on going. Oh, that's how it seemed for you. That's how it seemed for me, and when I when I went home, I sort of came to these rules, and I just kind of accepted them, and I sort of just went around them as I could. You mean when you came home, I mean after you left home and came back? So what you mean? No, just like for some for some adolescents, they they managed to. They get to a certain age and they, they try, and be, try and test all the rules and try and break as many rules as they can. So you, you, you accepted the rules, that you were aware of the fact that these rules from childhood were carrying on into your adolescence, but you kind of accepted that. Mm. Okay, but what about your younger brother, you were saying? Uh, he just, he wasn't so much rebellious, he just didn't keep the rules. <laughs> <laughs> Now, was he the youngest the in the family? Yeah. Out of how many? Three. Out of three, okay. Andrew, where did you come in your birth order? Two out of four. So you're number two. Yeah. You're this one here. Yeah, and I was the only son. So, um, so as you watched your oldest sibling going through adolescence, did you come to any conclusions about how to survive adolescence in your family? Yeah, well, I never found it easy to get on with her right through childhood we kind of avoided each other real different personality whereas the uh, personality is a Freudian concept yeah. if you want to be Freudian that's fine but anyway we didn't we were a bit more like that so we figured out early on just let's not have that and let's just move around the place without a lot of interaction but my younger two sisters 
we all three got on really well. So as you, I, have you observed your older sibling going through adolescence, did you come to any conclusions about how you were going to handle that part of your yeah, life? Yeah, I wasn't going to do it like her. Because? Well, yeah, she you know, wanted this kind of gene, and why should she do this? And she's pretty strong will. So there's a lot of, she got in a lot of grief with, with her parents? Not compared to some other family, but yeah, quite a lot. Well, compared to your family? Within your family, especially, yeah. Okay, so you, as you observed your older sister relating to your yeah. mother, you figured out how you were going to survive adolescence with your mother. Yeah, I just keep the peace, and I hated the supreme father, so I didn't want to do what my older sister did because I was supposed to be. So as you, you know, as you, as you're talking to people, maybe talking to adolescents, maybe talking to young people, young adults. Uh, and perhaps in a counselling situation, talking to family situation, and you ask a question about birth order, you see, and, and, and you're, you're thinking about, well, you know, if someone's the oldest or the middle or the youngest, maybe it has had an effect on the dynamics in the family for them as they were going through that period of transition when they become more aware of the family dynamics, you know, and they become most aware of the family dynamics just before they leave their family of origin. Michelle, where did you come in your birth order? The first of three. So what do you think your younger siblings learnt by observing you going through adolescence? Um, I was a lot of trouble for my parents, so my younger sibling, especially she, resented me for causing my parents so much trouble, and she was kind of a really good girl. <laughs> So I thought that was favoritism, but it wasn't. Now looking back, it's, it was just that she was easy. And so, yeah. so maybe she looked at you and thought, well, I know how to avoid that kind of grief yeah. by doing not doing the things that yeah. Michelle's doing. Yeah. And, and isn't that interesting how, how this, um, this really imprints upon us as people, you see, and we go into adulthood with this imprint that was developed in adolescence. You see, back here in childhood, you're not thinking about your birth order, you're not looking at it. You know, here, you see, suddenly you're seeing whole, everything differently and you're thinking, how can I survive adolescence in this, in this home? And you may look at your older siblings if you've got some older siblings and learn some lessons, but you see how that's a precursor to the bigger question, how can I survive as an adult out in the real world? And you're beginning to answer that question for you as an adolescent in your family of origin. And you see how absolutely important it is that within the family of origin, you, you begin to answer that question not in a way that's just simply a reaction to not be like others, but which understands your own place in God's world and your own place in this family as a person of, of uh, integrity, of honesty, and a person of adventure, a person who uh, wants to live authentically, rather than simply living um, in response to their parents' rules or living in response to their si siblings' experiences of adolescence. Because you go into adulthood now and that's, that imprint goes with you. In adolescence, they are becoming aware that the family is a dynamic unit, constantly changing and perhaps in danger of coming apart. That's not an awareness they had in childhood, unless there's a dramatic crisis in the family during childhood, like a parent dies or a sibling dies or there's divorce. Generally speaking, it's not until adolescence that they become aware that the family is a dynamic unit and not a static unit. See, here for the child, the family is static. Stable, predictable, always there. As an adolescent, that's no longer the case. It's no longer stable. It's no longer predictable. Suddenly, you know, mother's rages or dad's rages are suddenly life-changing and life-threatening for the adolescent because they're now locked in a battle of wills which, which really wasn't the case back here. So... Uh, <clears throat> And the adolescent is aware of this dynamic going on and, and, uh, and in many ways the adolescent uh, finds they can't go back. They can't put the genie back in the bottle. You know, they're out. You know, hormonal changes is happening. Um, uh, and all those changes we saw, uh, you know, last week, they're all happening. The clocks are all racing ahead, it seems. You can't put the genie back in the bottle and yet it feels like you know, if we go on like this, something dreadful is going to happen in our family, or to me, or to our relationship with my parents. And, and 
uh, you know the teenager can become a little desperate a little desperate about all that a little feeling like things are just out of control what was static and predictable is now dynamic and unpredictable and that feeling of things being out of control about the relationships that are most important to that adolescent beginning to break down from the adolescent's point of view they're beginning to break down the adolescent doesn't want to lose the relationship with the family of origin it's the only stable rock during adolescence that they have and yet if the family of origin is not handling that adolescent phase well the adolescent could find themselves on a point of desperation and helplessness and darkness without a clear way forward now we know that New Zealand has the highest rates of youth suicide in the Western world both male and female suicide in the Western world why is that well if we knew we'd fix it <laughs> you see nobody knows because you can't ask the person why they did it so it's all guesswork basically but you see here already you see where 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 that angst begins it begins in adolescence and and if the child survives you see the reason why parents throw 21st birthday parties for their children is because the 21st birthday party is the parents way of saying to the world we survived it we survived the kids adolescent and they're here but you see in New Zealand it's even more significant that a 21st birthday party is basically the parents saying to the world my child is still alive mm. they haven't hung themselves see they're here and yes we've been through some tough times but they're here thank God they're here well maybe a 21st birthday party is a little premature maybe we should push it out to a 25th birthday party or even a 30th because of where adolescence is heading uh, it's um, so I you know we, we have to take seriously the struggles of adolescence if for no other reason than the youth suicide rate in New Zealand we have to and as we think about our families and our churches and, and our neighborhoods and you have the opportunity to to step into a family to step into their into the heart of the family um, to be able to talk with the family in a way that doesn't isolate the adolescent as being the problem the family will tend to gang up against the problem men member and and they become the identified patient as that's a it's a term from family systems theory so if if the family kind of gang up against the troublesome one the troublesome one is now feeling isolated and even more desperate somehow the family has to figure out a way to reach out to the troublesome one and keep that one within the family within the family without requiring that troublesome one to to revert back to being seven years of age they're not seven they're 17 what was a protecting and nurturing cocoon is changing and the adolescent can feel increasingly compelled to leave it while at the same time being very aware of their need for stability and security now some of you know my children so I'm going to be very careful here about what I say but um, when my son was 17 he left home and traveled around the world on his own and the reason he did it was to get away from me you see he felt compelled to leave but after he'd been away for a year and had all kinds of adventures he came back and um, uh, we had the breathing space we needed and and the relationship had turned a corner and he, he he came back wanting to be part of the family circle wanting to be back with his parents and with his siblings and um, uh, and that never really changed from that point on uh, his uh, commitment and his involvement and his desire to be part of the family has only grown since that point all, all that to say it's so it's so expected that an adolescent particularly an adolescent who is who is uh, finding it difficult with the family of origin will on one hand want to leave but on one hand won't want to leave and and they might want to stretch it out 
uh, the band that connects them to the family of origin, but they don't want that band cut. Uh, while he was away, this was before emails, I wrote to him every week, the year he was away, and he said to me when he came back that that was, that was the highlight of his week, waiting for that letter. You see, they, they want to leave, but they don't want to leave. And, and you see the difficulty for the adolescent? They don't understand a lot of what's going on. They're aware of what they're feeling, they're aware of the angst in the family, and, and it, it grieves them, but they feel like they can't do anything about it. The family unit during these adolescent years is undergoing strain and tension. The adolescent should not be seen as the identified patient. Now, if you were to ask anyone else in the family other than the adolescent, why is your family unit going through strain and tension, they would point to the troublesome adolescent and say, because of that person. <laughs> you know, if they would just, I don't know, have a, have a closer walk with God, if they just grow up, if they just sort themselves out, if they get into a better headspace, you know, all these things, you hear them. If, in other words, if the adolescent could just sort themselves out, we could go back to being the happy family that we always were. But you see, things can never go back. Things can never go back. The whole family has to readjust to a brand new reality. And the brand new reality is that you no longer have parents and children, you now have parents and maturing young adults or well, adolescents on the way to adult maturity things can never be the same <clears throat> there's much else going on um, within the family unit beside the adolescent not only is the dynamics of all the relationships but even um, beyond that uh, for the parents themselves the grandparents are getting older and they need caring for and the parents themselves are perhaps going through their own midlife crisis. Parental insecurity or divorce during these years can have a significant effect on the adolescent, which may only be seen at a later age stage. So, for instance, here's the, uh, here's the adolescent, and here's the parents, and here are the, the younger children, and up here are the grandparents. And you see the parents are sandwiched. A sandwich between the needs of the grandparents and the adolescent. And the parents can feel like they've been squashed. You know, they've been suddenly, suddenly, uh, not only are their adolescent now going through a crisis, the parents are going through a crisis, the grandparents are going through the crisis. Maybe, maybe the mother's going through menopause. Maybe the father is, uh, has plateaued in his job far earlier than he expected and going through the grief and loss of that and, and uh, he's looking to his wife for things that she can't provide him and she's looking to him for things that he can't provide her and in the meantime they've got this adolescent acting up and running around with the wrong crowd and wearing all the wrong clothing and perhaps smoking pot or maybe tobacco. Which is worse? Oh, it's so hard to raise adolescents. You see, you know all that kind of confusion. And then, and then, meanwhile, the grandparents are, are you know, they they're having needs, and you know, how come you never come to see us anymore? How come we never get to see the kids? And you know, what are you guys doing? And and and, or maybe they're going through their own health crisis. You see, and so the parents are being sandwiched, and uh, all that's going on. And it, you know, if it gets too bad, then you know what's going to happen. You know, is dad going to leave? The adolescent going to leave? I was working with a family once and the parents came to me because their, their uh, 16, 17 year old daughter had left home and moved in with this guy about her own age and uh, they would never tell me what the guy's name was. They just referred to him as dropkick. He was a dropkick. And I'm not quite sure what they meant by that but I think they meant it to be derogatory. And, uh, and they were very concerned and they were, um, they uh, gave the, the girl a hard time and uh, they gave the younger siblings a hard time, they gave each other a hard time and after about two years of all of that, the mother ran off with her boss 
You see, they weren't, they weren't able as a family unit to come together and deal with the adolescent reality of that, of that girl's behaviour and eventually the whole family spun apart. Now, that's, you might think that's an extreme case. Maybe it isn't. Maybe it's just, maybe it's not an extreme case. And so she went off and found her own dropkick. You see, and, and, and you know, who, what was going on there? Was she, what was the mother's issues that she really felt resentful that the girl had, had gone off and done the things which the mother always wished she could have done, you know, and broken out and, and, and well, you know, here she is breaking out in middle, middle adulthood. Many of the, the difficulties that adolescents go through don't show up until later in life. Um, one, one, classic, one classic example of this is that when the parents themselves first begin to confront the adolescents and their own children, say their first child hits adolescence, that can often raise to the surface for the parents a lot of unresolved issues from their adolescence. Now all of a sudden their parents are uh, are wanting more of them and, and, and these parents are beginning to relive their adolescent struggles with these people and meanwhile having to face this one and, and, and they find that in fact however they resolved it here by leaving home or just burying it or whatever uh, here now it, it's, it's coming to the surface as they're having to relate to their aged parents and with all that, without all that stuff being resolved in their own adolescence, uh, adolescent children, bringing it to their, crashing in on them really, the unresolved issues from their own adolescence which they thought were in the past and now the adolescent child is bringing it very much into their present. So parents face their own fears and insecurities and these may come to the surface when they are faced with adolescent behaviours. Some of the fears that parents have as they deal with their adolescent children, they fear the loss of relationship with the child. They fear uh, rejection by their children. This is a genuine fear. They fear that uh, the situation is untenable. If the child leaves home and shakes the dust off their feet, then they'll never see the grandchildren. And, and you know, we know situations, don't we, where, where grandparents are bereft of their grandchildren because the parents never resolve the issues with the grandparents. And so, you know, all the way down here, the pain and the grief continues. The pain and the grief that began here is pushed forward into these other age stages because it hasn't been resolved. Uh, <clears throat> they fear a loss of control over the family unit if they feel that their values are being disregarded by their, say, this one here, then the parents are afraid that's going to affect the other siblings further down here and they'll lose control over those other siblings. And so they crack down on the first one or the first two in order to ensure that the younger ones don't step out of line. What's, what's behind that? Well, a, a loss of control over the family unit. And, and you see, somebody that they trust, somebody needs to whisper in their ear right around that time, um, these kids will soon be gone anyway. The reason you're losing control is because you're losing control. They're going to be gone. No control. I was talking to a guy recently and his wife had walked out on him. And, um, and this was, uh, and it was all over the, the, the issue was the, uh, was the adolescent boy in the home. Now, uh, the adolescent boy was his biological son but not hers and she felt that he was giving the boy more attention more attention that he was giving her it became very apparent in, in talking to them as a couple that the father's commitment to the boy was far greater than his commitment to his wife to his second wife and she felt that you see and it's this it's this um, uh, <coughs> This feeling of the loss of control, this woman, this wife felt that she had lost control in the family, that the father and the son had ganged up against her and pushed her out. There's only the three of them, 
in the family and she just felt isolated and empty. And so she was struggling with her own fears. She wasn't able to relate the, to the adolescent boy anymore because she was so caught up with her own desperate reality that these two males didn't want her in, in their lives anymore. That's how she perceived it. Um, <clears throat> parents can fear that their own needs are not being met. Their adolescent children are disrespecting them. They're not loving them. And the parents aren't, haven't been appreciated by them. Um, so, whereas back here, you see, you could always get a cuddle from your seven-year-old son. A cuddle from your 17-year-old son? You've got to be joking. All you get is a grunt. So what is that, how does that leave the parent feeling? Well, you see, if the parents are tall and secure in their own relationship with their spouse, if they're tall and secure in their own relationship with other significant people in their lives, you know, and they've always looked to their children for some of that, you know, and now in adolescence the child's denying it to the parent, it would seem. The parent now suddenly feels very bereft, very anxious about that. Uh, you know, you'll often hear them say, you know, we, we used to get on so well together. And now she won't even talk to me. Uh, the parents now fear failure and incompetence, shame and guilt. Um, how will we appear before others if our children are acting out as, as adolescents? Um, they fear a failure. They, they sense their powerlessness or their incompetence or their powerlessness to be able to influence what's happening with the adolescent. The adolescent is very much now going their own way. Okay, anything that we've been saying thus far this evening that you, you want to make a comment about? Generational, what do you call it? Well, you have the charts of each generation and the relationships and you look for patterns. Oh, genograms, oh, yes. Yeah, they, they really help to reveal what hasn't been resolved because it carries on further down, like the same kind of pattern. I can see that in my family, which is fairly good. But yeah, you see that the relationship like a mother had with her oldest son. He ended up halfway around the world and then down there is another where that similar sort of relationship has gone like that as well. What what uh, Andrew's talking about is uh, genograms and often when you're talking to someone, perhaps in a counselling situation, you might want to do a genogram. You'll learn, learn all about this in marriage and family counselling. Uh, and you start out with the, the grandparents um, um, on each side and from then comes down the uh, the parents this is the parents of the one you're talking to and uh, and then uh, the parents have X number of children and the one you're talking to might be here for instance and uh, and then you and you get all the information and then you start asking questions about the relationships the um, and and so you, then you put in, you know, this this indicates perhaps a good relationship, and this in, indicates a bad relationship. See, and and you might find that we have a we have a good relationship here, and a a, a, a bad relationship here, or we might have um, a bad relationship with with uh, the with the mother, 
and uh, we might have a, um, say, a bad relationship with the mother and a good relationship with the father. And as you put all that in, then you stand back and you look at the diagram and, and you, could, you could then suddenly see well, there's a lot of conflict in this family. There's a lot of generational conflict in this family. Or you might stand back and you might see a lot of straight lines and not too many crooked lines and, and you might say to yourself, well, it seems at first glance there's not much conflict in this family. Well, it just means that the person you're talking to hasn't told you about any conflict. See, so you ask, well, a few, ask a few more questions. Yeah, often you don't hear about people don't like telling tales and all that either and the past is the past and all that but if you, you know, when you get into your 30s and that is when you start to hear the little family secrets that aren't disastrous or anything but it's like, oh yeah that, that's interesting and then you put them all together and you know there is actually a mother, such a great relationship it's, it's a pretend one sort of and things start to fall into place and make sense you know, why certain people don't turn off at Christmas well, they just pass in for 10 minutes and Leave again. all these little traditions that ways of avoiding things. And, and back here, you, you're not aware of that. But here, you become aware of those things, beginning to. The tensions in the family. Well, how do parents typically react to these tensions? And um, we're going to look at some authoritarian, overprotective, permissive and preoccupied before we look at the good one, which is authoritative. Now, you see, you're, you're looking... Now, the, we've separated them out to look at them, but in fact, there might be a mixture of these things going on. So if you're talking to someone at church, you know, on Sunday morning, and you say to them, well, how are things going? And they say, well, I'm, I'm really having a trouble. I'm really struggling with my 16-year-old right now. Now, you'll show empathy and you'll show interest and you might ask some questions for clarification and if you get the opportunity, you might ask some extending questions. Um, and, and as you ask these questions and as, you know, you, you, to prompt the conversation and as they're talking, you're, you're kind of thinking about Johnny, you know Johnny, and you're thinking about Johnny's parents, you know his parents, and you're thinking about what you think are the family dynamics. You may not have been spent much that time, much time within the family circle. You might have only seen them at church when they're on their best behaviour. But you're, you're thinking about them and as you're listening to the parent, this concerned parent talking, you might be thinking about them in these terms. You know, here's some insight into how the parents are dealing with Johnny. Are they author authoritarian? Are they overprotective? Are they permissive? And, uh, and so you're beginning to get a reading on things, you see? And, and you're, you're um, getting a feel for things. So that if you have the opportunity to have this conversation again with them about Johnny, uh, and, and you've been thinking about these things in between the first and second conversation, and you, you've now got some questions to ask them to perhaps test uh, some of the impressions you might have been having in the first conversation. So you ask questions, questions they wouldn't think of asking themselves about the family dynamics, about their, about their parenting style, about how they deal with... Uh, their adolescent's behaviour. So this kind of information, this kind of these kind of insights can be very, very useful in just going beyond the immediate Johnny's causing, causing problems. The reason, one of the reasons this is very important is because as as that parent is talking to you about Johnny, what's often coming across is somehow we have to change Johnny's behaviour. The problem is the way Johnny is acting out. If we can get Johnny to behave better, then our family will be better. Now they've made Johnny the identified patient and they are committing themselves to changing Johnny's behaviour, a behavioralist approach. If we can just polish the outside of Johnny's cup, see, and get it nice and shiny, and let's not worry about what's on the inside of the cup. Now, that might be too severe a judgment on your part as you're listening, but as you think about the fact that, that as they talk to you, their pull on you is to get you to, to agree with them, to stand with them and say, yes, you know, Johnny's really misbehaving badly. Johnny really needs to, he needs to start coming to church regularly. He really needs to, you know, 
get different friends. In other words, you find yourself agreeing with this parent out of your desire to empathize, and, and, and then you end up you end up enabling the parent to hang on to their commitment to changing Johnny's behavior, and now they see you as an ally. Well, so you've got to avoid that pull. One way to avoid that pull is to just ask questions. And as you ask questions, you ask them empathetically, you ask the questions with a genuine interest to know and understand in order to be of help. And, but as you ask those questions, what you're doing is you're putting the speaker on notice that, that hmm, I'm not going to say, I'm not going to accept everything you say at face value. I'm just going to ask some clarifying questions here to get you to reflect a little bit deeper on what you're saying. But at the same time, I'm going to be with you and stand with you in this. I'm committed to talking to you about this issue because in your heart, you know that the answer to this issue is not for Johnny to change his behavior. That might be part of it. If Johnny's sinning, he needs to quit sinning. But at the end of the day, what this family needs is to have a look at the whole of the family dynamic, how this family operates as a family, and to see what changes need to take place. Do we have an angry father? Do we have an emotionally manipulative mother? Or do we have an angry mother and an emotionally manipulative father? I think we don't want to stereotype any of these behaviours. You see, and or what we have here, you see, and, and, and all this... Um, See, it's going to really help you to step into their lives and begin to uncover some of the hard issues for all the family members. Let's look at author authoritarian. Here the focus is on control and punishment without discussion. Now, you know what that's like. Don't answer back. Don't want any of your lip. This is the way it's going to be in this house. While you're under this roof, see, you don't ever say that. Because you know what the kid will do? You'll find another roof to live under. But you know, you, and, and now, the focus on control and punishment without discussion worked back here, didn't it? You see what's happened? The parent hasn't adjusted their child rearing strategy as they've moved into adolescent. And, and, you know, even when, when the kids in their 30s and 40s, the parents are still trying to tell them what to do. Well, I think you really ought to do this or do that. You should send your children to this school, not that school. And this, one, of, one of the family stories that are told in my family of origin is, is when, my, when my eldest brother was born, he was the first born, he was the first grandson on both sides for, for a long time, and... Um, my paternal grandmother decided that she was going to name him. <laughs> it's beyond belief, isn't it? People actually do these things. And, and, and so she named him uh, Stuart. She announced to my parents, her son and her daughter-in-law, that his name was to be Stuart because this was a family name, it was a big deal, first grandson, yada, yada, yada. And, well, um, you know, Dad, you know, <laughs> was willing to go along with it. Um, you ever seen um, Everyone Loves Raymond? Well, you know, he was the one who allowed his mother to control his life. So he was willing to go along with it, but my mother wasn't. She, uh, she came from a family of girls, and they were all pretty, you know, outspoken, and, you know, and she wasn't going to stand for it. So, um, but it was on the birth certificate and everything, you see? And, and, so, and so finally, finally, she put enough iron into my father and sent him down to the whatever office it was and changed their son's name by deed pole to John, which is what mother wanted. And so they compromised and called him John Stuart Reynolds. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's a story they were still telling when I came along, when I was adolescent. They were still telling, and Grandma was still in the family circle, and Dad was still dancing around Grandma, trying to keep her happy, and 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 Mum was just out there. And uh, well, it's unbelievable, isn't it? So control and punishment without discussion. And so here's Grandma still trying to tell these people her her adult son what what to name his own children. Now, see, back here, back here, they never resolve that dynamic. That as the parent 
must change their strategy towards their children from childhood through to adolescent to adulthood. So remember, it's not only the adolescent going through a transition from childhood to, adolescent, to adulthood, the parent is going through a transition here of, of adjusting the way they relate to the child from childhood to adolescent. The way I relate to my child as an adult at 37 is different from the way I relate to them at 7, and that transition hits home during adolescence. And if the parent doesn't make that transition, then they're not going to help the adolescent make that transition. And if that doesn't happen, then, then parent and adolescent are not going to go on into the adolescent's adulthood with a relationship that's encouraging and a blessing and a joy. Now the difficulty, as you see with this identified patient, the parents don't realise that they are going through a time of transition as well. They are resisting transition during the adolescent period. They don't want anything to change about the way they view their children, the way they treat their children, the way they do family, the way they do parenting. They don't, they don't see themselves going through transition and they resent the adolescent for going through transition. Hence the crisis. So the focus is on control and punishment without discussion. In an authoritarian household, there's indoctrination rather than education. Uh, this is the way it's going to be, end of story. Um, rather than education, rather than let's sit down, have a family meeting, let's talk about what you want, let's talk about what you want, and we'll talk about what I want, and talk about what mother wants, and, and, and we'll put it all together, and we will educate one another on where each of us are coming from, and we will learn about each other's concerns and desires and fears, and we'll try to work this out so that all of us can continue to love each other well and have confidence in one another. See, that's education. Faced with this style of parenting, an adolescent will tend to retreat into sullen, submissive over-dependence with perhaps sneaky and deceitful tendencies, or they will rebel with angry and violent independence. Birth order can influence the direction the reaction might take. So you see, the eldest, the eldest child might um, react with with open rebellion, angry, and violent independence, and, and the and the younger siblings, as they observe that, um, then say, "Well, I'm not going to do that." And so their response to the authoritarian household is to retreat into sullen, submissive, over dependence. Perhaps you know this is the the good girl, the nice boy who never puts a foot wrong and stays out of trouble, keeps their head down. But inside, you see, they, they're, um, all is not good. On the inside, they're, they're not as good as they appear on the outside. Okay, well, books have been written about authoritative, authoritarian parenting. That's just one paragraph. Anything you'd like to say about authoritarian parenting at the adolescent stage? You don't, you don't have to talk about your own situation if you don't want to. You could talk more generally about uh, perhaps people you've known, your own peers who've grown up as adolescents and households that were like this and the effect it's had on them. Anything that kind of relates this back to your own life experience or of people you know well. I want to think of that movie, Dead Poets Society. Mm -hmm. Yeah, with that one guy who was in that his what he was gifted at and where he wanted to go in life was totally different than his father, but his father was just shut him down. And yeah, it just in the end he was like hopeless. He just saw no hope. There's nowhere for the kid to go, was there? Yeah, he, he had to, he was basically crushing him. He couldn't express who he was. You know. So the, the father cut off all the exits yeah. and boxed the boy in. Cut off all the, all the exits, there's no way out. Yeah, and at the end, uh, the end, he still couldn't see it. He's blaming other people for it. Yeah. Everyone else on the successful and happy. Yeah. yeah, that was a real powerful movie. What's that movie that Steve Williams gets you to watch in Married and Family? Oh yeah. Um, Ordinary people. Yeah. Ordinary people with um, Mary Tyler Moore. Really. Can you? Uh, um, that's a that's a that's a very very powerful movie movie about parents' failure to deal with adolescence, mm. and uh, 
where that goes. Again, um, certainly on the mother's part, authoritarian in that movie. Okay, well look, let's take a break and we'll come back and look at overprotective parenting style. We, this is the opposite of author, um, authoritarian, the overprotective parent. Here the parent's anxieties and fears are loaded onto the adolescent and can be used to manipulate adolescent behaviour. Uh, so here, the, here's where the parent uses emotional, emotional manipulation to, to, to um, make the, ad the adolescent feel guilty because of the effect that the adolescent's behaviour is having on the parent. So rather than the parent getting strong, the parent goes the other way and becomes weak and needy and helpless and blames the adolescent for putting them in that, in that position, in that role. And so the uh, uh, seeking to manip use guilt to manipulate the adolescent behaviour. Um, the child is never allowed to grow up, but rather must construct their lives around their parents' fears. The adolescent can become more like a parent and, and a role reversal situation. Now, this is this is often quite common if the um, if say the father leaves, divorce, and the mother is left, and the mother looks to say her teenage children or teenage daughter to uh, fill up some of that emotional. Um, hole in her life and requires the adolescent to suddenly be an adult so that uh, and, and relates to the adolescent as an adult and requires adult input from the adolescent and uh, when the mother has an emotional breakdown she looks to the adolescent to comfort her see that role reversal and and so um, rather than the adolescent being able to go through this transition as their, as their clocks would have them go through this transition. Their behaviour in adolescence has to, be, has to be reconfigured around the parents' neediness and the parents' fears. And so they go into adulthood believing that the way, um, the way that I have to live my life is to reconfigure my behaviour around the needs of others. Uh, and so, for instance, you... You often find in churches, for instance, you find women who are, for all intents and purposes, people pleasers. They, they're the first ones into the kitchen to do the dishes. They're the first ones to, you know, to clean if someone needs cleaning. And, and what they offer you is their busyness. What they offer you is their service rather than offering you authentic relationship, rather than offering you any substance of themselves. They offer what they can do to serve you and then they ask you to be content with that and don't require anything more from them. Well see that could be something they learnt in adolescence when that kind of behaviour was rewarded by a needy parent. Uh, and so the adolescent girl for instance kind of takes over and cleans the house and makes sure the meals are on time while the mother is, is kind of uh, emotionally um, absent and then the, the adolescent uh, daughter gets a lot of affirmation for that and so goes into adulthood believing that's her her calling or her role or her her way of um, relating in ways that can make her feel useful, valued and um, appreciated. So that's the overprotective parent whose anxieties and fears are loaded in the adolescent rather than their anxiety and fears taken to the Lord or taken to a counsellor like one of you guys. What about the permissive and preoccupied parent? Here's where the preoccupied parent, neg ne emotional neglect, where the parent is preoccupied with their own lives and allows the adolescent to live however they want to. Here there are a few demands with no set boundaries. The parent feels either weak, helpless and needy or too busy to involve themselves with the lives of their adolescents. Adolescent. They fear rejection by their adolescent who now tends to look to their own peers for their moral guidance. Um, the uh, Back here, when the father's too busy with his job to spend time with his children, see back here when the child is, what, um, six, seven, eight, 
nine years of age. The father is, what, late 30s, early 40s. He's right at the time where he's putting all his strokes into his career. This is the time for him to, career-wise, develop and advance his career or his earning capacity uh, before things begin to plateau down here. And um, they're accepting more responsibility at work, perhaps accepting promotion and so on. And so what happens often is the father's too busy to spend time, say, with the, with the boy, the seven, eight, nine-year-old boy. And, and so now this boy is now an adolescence. And back here, the child uh, kind of accepted it. He was sad, he accepted it. He didn't really have the emotional wherewithal to do anything else with it. But now as an adolescent, the father is uh, still busy and the adolescent boy wants his father in his life. And, 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 but the difference is now the adolescent boy is beginning to resent the father's absence, whereas back here perhaps he was more accepting, perhaps the mother was able to compensate and make up for it, but of course now she can't. Adolescent boy doesn't want his mother in his life, wants his father for the obvious reasons. So uh, the, the, the over-busy father, the emotionally neglectful father is now sowing to the wind here and is reaping a whirlwind here and unless the father repents of his son <laughs> and, and the adolescent boy is going to go into adulthood resenting the father and that resentment will um, remain for decades unless it's resolved. Uh, now we come to authoritative. This is the good one. This is where there is both delight and discipline. Um, both delight in the adolescent, where the parent is delighting in the adolescent, uh, not delighting in their sinful behavior, if there is sinful behavior, but delighting in the fact that they're going through a transition, which the parent recognizes they're going through a transition, and they delight in that transition because they know it's a necessary transition for their child to become an adult that they can uh, spend the rest of their life having a wonderful relationship with. So it's a transition which the parent is able to delight in, even if the adolescent struggles to delight in the transition they're going through. The parent is able to delight in it with them and for them and is able to reassure them. Uh, and there's also discipline. There's grace and truth are not separated in the authoritative home. There is listening, discussion, and the giving of reasons with patience, respect, and courtesy. That's by the parent to the adolescent. There is patience, respect, and courtesy. Um, uh, in the face of the adolescent's uh, perhaps sinful behavior, the parent uh, remains patient, respectful, and courteous. The parent remains in an attitude of wanting to listen, wanting to take on board the uh, adolescent's concerns, and is willing to listen to their reasons and offers their own reasons with patience, respect, and courtesy. Now, you see, the parent that does this best is the parent that does not see the adolescent as the identified patient. Yes, the adolescent is acting up, may even be acting sinfully, but the parent knows that at this stage of transition, what's most important is for the parent to maintain relationship with the adolescent. They would like the adolescent perhaps to stop doing the things they're doing. They would like the adolescent perhaps to have a closer walk with the Lord. They would like the adolescent to exhibit some mature, grown-up traits and tendencies. But however, the reality is the adolescent is going through a transition which has them acting out in ways contrary to the family values. Now the parents see the relationship with the adolescent being more important than modifying the behavior of the adolescent. Back here, you can modify their behavior and not lose the relationship. Here, you run a real risk. If you're still trying to modify the behavior, you'll lose the relationship. In, in, uh, in an authoritative home, there is a, uh, the patience, respect, and courtesy comes from parents who value the relationship with the adolescent as being primary. In other words, they're not driven by their own sense of fear or guilt or shame in their relationship with the adolescent. They're secure and confident as to where they are as parents in, in their relationship to God and relationship to one another in the marriage and their relationship to their adolescent and to their other children, to their friends and their church and their work and their family. They've, they've found their place and they're at peace within themselves 
with their place. And, and the adolescents acting out is not, not going to disrupt that feeling of intactness and solidness and confidence before God that the, the parent has within their own heart. Which means then the parent is now able to offer good things from their heart to the adolescent. The adolescent's behaviour is not forcing the parent's heart to go to a place where all they can offer is authoritative or neglectful or angry or demanding or manipulative. The, parents, the, the adolescent's behaviour is of concern to the parent, but the parent remains, maintains a non-anxious presence in, a, in their relationship with their adolescent. Their confidence is in God. Uh, the parent, the Christian parent, knows that while their parenting may indeed have a significant influence on their adolescent and their adolescent's growth up into adulthood, they know that their parenting will not determine what happens to the adolescent in adolescence or in adulthood. Their parenting may have a, will have a significant impact, but it will not determine. God alone determines. You and I do not determine how our kids turn out. We have a significant impact, for good or for ill, but only God determines. Hence you hear glowing testimonies of children who come from atrocious backgrounds, and here they are with glowing testimonies for Christ. You see, their backgrounds had an impact, but didn't determine. On the other hand, very sadly, you hear, you, you hear stories of children who grew up in lovely Christian homes and have grown up and are no longer walking with the Lord. Again, you see, that home had an impact but did not determine. And so the parent who is able to be authoritative, who is able to maintain patience, respect and courtesy toward their adolescent, is the parent who understands that, that nothing that's going to happen in the, in, the ad, in the adolescent's life ultimately reflects back on me because I'm not the determining factor here. For the adolescent, it ultimately reflects back on their relationship with God. And so the parent is able to maintain a non-anxious presence and continue to offer good things. Much like the father in the story of the prodigal son. The parents take time to understand their adolescence. Uh, they do a Google search on adolescents. They read some books. They talk to other parents who have done a good job with adolescents. They talk to the adolescent themselves, seeking so to understand them what's going on with them. The adolescent has concerns, a whole heap of concerns, about things which are no concern to the parents. Generally speaking, <laughs> if the parents are together, you know, by the time the parents are here, they're not that concerned about their appearance. They get a zit on their chin, it's not the end of the world. See, when you're here, and, and, and uh, see, adolescent's concerned about these things, you know, about my hair and you know, and about, you know, whatever adolescents are concerned about. See, it's different concerns from the parents. And, and the parents have a hard job understanding it. They see those concerns and they tend to write them off as childish, as immature, and they want the child to grow up. Uh, but rather, see, a, a good parent will, will seek to understand and talk to the child about those things, the adolescent about those things, and seek to understand. Um, they take time. They're able to delight in evidences of mature independence and developing adulthood. Let me just say a word here about um, adolescent girls and adolescent boys. Um, the issues are different for them. We've already talked about that. Didn't we just talk about uh, the role of parents in this? First of all, the role of the father was first his adolescent son and then his adolescent daughter. To his adolescent son, the father's role is to reassure the adolescent male that they've got what it takes to be men in an unsafe world. Now remember the adolescent male is looking primarily to his father for the answer to the question, have I got what it takes to be a man in an unsafe world? And he's looking to his father, and if he sees that his father has got what it takes, if he sees qualities of manhood in his father that he, could, that he respects, then he, will, then he will gladly follow his father's example and his father's mentoring in that regard. Now as he seeks to do that, it's very important that the father affirms any evidences he sees in his adolescent son of the, of, of the 
the son reaching out and seeking to be independent, to make his mark, to do the manly thing, to make decisions, to accept responsibility, to take a risk. And he'll encourage that, and he'll affirm that, and he'll tell the boy how proud he is of him, and encourage him uh, to move. He'll, he'll, he'll help the boy come up with, with areas in the boy's life where he can begin to accept more responsibility. The father will be there to help the boy if he stumbles and pick him up. And, and you see, all the time, what the father is doing is instilling into his adolescent son, you have what it takes. I believe in you. I'm proud of you. You're my son. What can the father do for his adolescent daughter? The adolescent daughter is growing up very aware of the fact that uh, she's becoming... Um, her sexual identity is developing, and she, she sees herself more as a sexual being out there in the world. And her questions are around uh, um, safety, uh, protection, uh, attractiveness. Uh, will I be able to pull it off? Will I be able to do what mum did and get a guy who's, you know, who's a good father and a good husband? So she has those kinds of uncertainties. And what can the... What can the father do to reassure the heart of his adolescent daughter? He needs to remind his adolescent daughter that she is beautiful, that she is his princess, not his little girl. You'll always be my little girl. That doesn't help. It's okay when you're back here. But he, she needs to hear from him that uh, he thinks she's beautiful and, and uh, so that she knows there's at least one man in the world for whom that, that's been settled. There's one man in the world who thinks I'm beautiful. Maybe there could be another one out there somewhere. You see? So she's beginning to believe. Uh, and, and, and what else can the father do for his adolescent daughter? Well, he needs to listen to her heart when she's upset, when she's crying. Adolescent girls cry sometimes. When, when they're crying, when they're upset, when they're concerned. The father sits down and, and he, he intently listens to her heart. He steps into her heart. He steps into her life. He steps into her world with kindness, with gentleness, with love, with concern, with patience. He takes as long as it takes. However long this conversation takes, is fine. However many times we come back to this conversation, that's fine. What he's communicating to his teenage daughter is that he values her heart. He loves her heart. He wants to understand her heart. He wants to be a man for her heart. So she's beginning to experience what it means to be loved by a man for her heart, for who she is on the inside. So that when the boys start coming after her for her body, she'll see that and she'll say, now hold on. What I really want is a man who'll come after me for my heart, like my father did. She had a taste. He's given her a taste of what that's like. And she won't settle for anything out less and a man who purports to love her and to care for her. What can a mother do for an adolescent son? Well, the adolescent son is trying to distance himself from his mother. And he's, he, he's, he's very aware of the fact he needs to establish a male identity for himself separate from his mother. And so hence he's looking more to the father and here's what's absolutely essential that the father is available for the adolescent boy. Um, now, the mother has to deal with her own issues as she sees her adolescent son taking steps to be separate, independent from her. She has to deal with her own fears. It's not that he doesn't love her. It's not that he's going to you know, go away and never come back. Um, you know, a son is a son until he finds a wife, a daughter is a daughter for the rest of her life. And there is a sense, you see, in which there comes a time in a young man's life where he has to experience a mother's love from a distance. So he will distance himself, but he doesn't want to lose the relationship with his mother. He has to do that in order to become a man. Now, what can the mother do for her teenage son? Well, she can recognize those fears and anxieties in her own heart as she sees him becoming that independent man. But, but in order to be um, a mother that can help her son grow up into godly manhood, she needs to look for opportunities to reassure him that he has got what it takes. See, his, um, his first question 
the adolescent male, his first question is, have I got what it takes to be a man in an unsafe world? And the father answers that. His second question, which comes hard on the heels, have I got what it takes to get the woman? Now, the mother is the beginning of the answer. She's not the whole answer, obviously. He's got to leave his mother to find the answer to that question. But what the mother does for the teenage boy is to begin to instill in his heart that he has got what it takes. That she finds him attractive, she's proud of him, she sees what he's doing, she sees his growing evidences of manhood and she affirms that, she delights in his growing independence. You see, she's going to have to be able to maintain a, a non-anxious presence in the light of his growing independence. Um, and so the teenage boy then knows, as he asks himself that second question, that as far as his mother's concerned, there is one woman in the world who thinks I'm great. And that's a start. <laughs> doesn't end there, but that's a start. Now I said earlier that I was my mother's favourite and that had a lot of downsides, but it had one very positive good side for me. As I went through adolescence, I never really had any problem about the fact that, that uh, um, I mightn't be able to have a girlfriend because my mother thought I was great, so maybe other girls would too. You see, now rightly or wrongly, I went through adolescence and into young adulthood with that confidence in my own heart. It wasn't that I had to... You see, now, if, adole if the adolescent male never gets that from his mother, you see, then he goes into adulthood or through adolescence looking, at it, looking for that from other women in all the wrong places. OK, what can the mother do for the adolescent daughter? Well, for the adolescent daughter, the mother is, uh, is a listening ear and a shoulder to cry on. The, the, um, the, the adolescent daughter wants to know that there's no issue that she's grappling with that her mother can't take time to listen to her as another woman. <clears throat> what the mother is communicating to her adolescent daughter is whatever you're feeling is okay. Whatever you're struggling with is okay. Uh, sister to sister, woman to woman, uh, adult woman to adult woman. You see, we have the mother's an adult woman and the adolescent daughter is on her way to being an adult woman. And so there... Um, <sighs> The mother is, is able to maintain a non-anxious presence in the face of her teenage daughter's angst. You know, her heart's been broken over some boy that didn't look at her twice. You know, it's stuff which seems like um, not that big a deal to someone who's in their 30s, late 30s, but for a teenage girl it's life-shattering stuff. And the mother understands about the importance of the girl's concern over her image and over her hair and over her makeup and how she looks and the clothes she wears. And, and, and instead of the mother... Um, reacting to that. You know, she talks to the daughter about that and affirms it where she can and helps her. And um, In other words, what she's communicating to her teenage daughter is that it's okay to feel the way you feel and to have the concerns that you have because the, teenage, uh, the, the mother knows that it's a transition. See, the teenage girl thinks, you know, my whole life, for the rest of my life, is dependent on this one issue getting this one issue sorted. The mother knows it's a transition. So she's, she's going to walk with her daughter through this, knowing that it'll one day resolve itself into delightful adulthood. Okay, anything you want to say about uh, how we can help our adolescent sons and daughters? Okay, um, so uh, these parents set boundaries and provide direction. There is friendship as well as framework. Friendship as well as framework, I put that in italics. It's not that you have to be your daughter or your son's best friend, but there is friendship. There's a growing friendship. There's a growing appreciation of each other, uh, but there's also a framework that the parent continues to provide. The parents are humble and willing to say sorry. What difference would it have made in your adolescent years if the parent you struggled with the most humbled themselves and apologised to you while you were an adolescent of the ways they had sinned against you? That would have been uh, a life moment. These parents are humble and willing to say sorry. Why are they humble and willing to say sorry? 
because they live out of the gospel. They live repentant lives anyway. They're offering, often apologizing to their spouse and seeking forgiveness. They're often, often confessing their sins to the Lord and seeking forgiveness. So to confess their sin to their adolescent son or daughter and seek their forgiveness is something which is just part of the way they live, love and relate. They delight over their adolescence as gifts from God. These parents are willing to allow adolescent choices to bring their own consequences without withdrawing support. This is important. See, back here, you're protecting the children from the consequences of their decisions. Back here, when they're children. You're protecting them from the consequences of their decisions. You won't let them poke their fingers into the power outlet. You won't let them get too close to the stove where there's boiling water. See, you're protecting them from the consequences of their decisions. Here, as the adolescent goes through these years, you're less and less concerned about protecting them from the consequences of, the of their decisions, but more concerned about being in relationship with them as they endure those consequences. See, what often happens is uh, the parent who says, well, just let them bear the consequences of their decisions, when those consequences came, come along, the parent stands back and says, well, you made your bed, now you've got to line it. Tough bickies, you reap what you sow. Rather, you see, you, the, the reason you don't protect them from the, try to protect them from the consequences, once, one, it's not going to work because they're going to require you to exercise more control than you're going to be able to control, uh, able to exercise. So the other reason why you don't want to try to protect them from their consequences is because they will never mature into adulthood if they don't have the opportunity to stumble and fall while they, were, while they are in your family circle. While they're adolescents, that's the time for them to fail when you are there to pick them up. If you prevent them from ever going through that experience, then back here, when they stumble and fall, what are they going to do? See, they won't have learned how to handle crisis. So uh, they are willing to allow adolescent choices to bring their own consequences without withdrawing support. They see the relationship is all important. Uh, conflicts with parents arise as the independence, dependence roles are being worked out in the adolescent as they proceed through this life stage. Wise parents carefully decide on the issues to deal with so as not to be fighting about everything. The issues they choose to confront may be determined by the traditional family values which the young person may no longer be prepared to buy into as they did when they were children. So there must be room for discussion and flex. Now I've got a quote here from the changing family life cycle. It has been found that adolescents are more likely to move towards autonomy in families where they are encouraged to participate in decision making. Now, they use the word autonomy there in a good sense. It's not rebellious autonomy, but it's autonomy as mature, independent adults. They're more likely to move towards that kind of maturity in families where they are encouraged to participate in decision making, but where parents ultimately decide what is appropriate. In this type of family, adolescents are also likely to model their parents and seek parent uh, and seek parent-approved peers. Uh, one example could be um, how long I'm, they're able to stay out at night. Now, the, the the parent might want them in by ten o'clock, and the adolescent might want to stay out till midnight. Um, now, together they they participate in and seeking to come to a decision about that, but the parent ultimately decides what is appropriate. And the parent now has the opportunity to say, well, maybe 11 o'clock is appropriate, or maybe 11.30 is appropriate. And so they decide on that. It's not necessarily a compromise. It's the parent continuing to make the decision about what's appropriate, but it's in the context of a mutual decision-making. And that type of family, adolescents are also likely to model their parents and to seek parent-approved peers. The same conditions that foster a sense of independence also builds closeness and affection between parents and adolescent children. See, it seems like a contradiction, doesn't it? The conditions that foster a sense of independence actually builds closeness. You see, the parent thinks of, if, if there's a growing independence, then that means the relationship's breaking down and there's distance, emotional distance in the relationship as the adolescent becomes more independent of the family, of the parents. But in fact, just the opposite happens. That as you, as you, in the authoritative situation, as you work with the adolescent and, and begin to help them to move in those areas of independence, they will love you for your support and encouragement. 
In contrast, adolescents raised in families where participation in decision-making and self-regulation is limited tend to become more dependent and less self-assured. Retaining control while being objective, supportive and democratic is not an easy task for most parents to accomplish. Retaining control while being objective, supportive and democratic is not an easy task. Seems impossible, doesn't it? Uh, especially when they feel the parents feel judged and criticised by their own children. Um, adolescents will criticise and judge their parents either outwardly or inwardly. And the reason they do that is not because <coughs> they want to break the relationship. The reason they do that is in order to separate themselves from their parents and become their own people. You see, that separation um, cannot happen, happen without hurt and grief. Now, the adolescent, in their relative immaturity, will see the way to separate themselves is to separate themselves by, by being critical and uh, judgmental of their parents. You know, you don't know anything, you're hopeless, you don't get it, therefore I'm going to go off and do this. You see how the adolescent justifies their actions to themselves? They do so by condemning the parents or criticising the parents. Um, now, the parent, if, see, if the parent can see that as all part of the transition, then they can maintain a non-anxious presence in the face of their children's criticism and negative judgments and uh, seek to continue to be objective and supportive and, and caring and loving, offer friendship and framework. Uh, parental tolerance will tend to be low if parents have not achieved emotional autonomy from their own parents or a sense of contentment with their own age stage. Now, in brackets, those are my words. They're not... I've just added that. Uh, but we've talked about that already. If they haven't achieved emotional independence from their own parents, then they're not going to be able to allow their adolescents to achieve emotional independence. It's uncharted territory for the parents. They've never been there with their own parents. If parents have unresolved conflicts with each other, their ability to accept the adolescent's desire for autonomy becomes impaired. The adolescent may then be triangled into power struggles between spouses or between parents and grandparents, which will complicate the process by increasing tension, dissatisfaction, misunderstanding and conflict for all. Where the adolescent feels rightly or wrongly, it's up to them to maintain the family, peace in the family, family coherence, family relationships. If there's problems here with mum and dad, the, peer, the adolescent will often try to resolve issues for the parents because the adolescent is terrified that the whole family is going to fly apart. Okay? Uh, anything you want to say about adolescence? We've come to the end of adolescence. Thankfully, adolescence is over for all of us. <laughs> well, not quite all of us. Katrina, it's all up ahead. Pure joy. Any comments? Confessions? Testimonies? Questions? Insights? Um, in some ways you get what you expect from people. It's kind of prophetic what you speak over people. Like I saw it in Africa with your employees. Like if the employers, I mean, usually like expats, if they had keys and they locked everything out because they didn't trust their workers, they might steal things. Then usually things got stolen. And plus they had to carry these keys around and be consumed with all that. It's just negative. Like, but if I sort of figured out, well, you know. If they steal stuff, they'll deal with it when it happens. It might happen, it might not, but you wait till it happens. Why consume, you know, your emotions of worrying about that? Just mm -hmm. trust them. And if they prove not trustworthy, then you deal with it. So, and, you know, with, I had a few people rip me off, but most of them, fantastic. Hey, they rise to the occasion, right? Because cause you trust them and you respect them and they, they want to live up to it, they, they really want to be that person that you're giving them the chance to be. So yeah, when sort of people don't expect better of you, I don't know, you resent it and then you end up doing that just to annoy them or something. You're thinking of adolescents and parents. Yeah, well I think it cuts through a lot of different relationships, but definitely with adolescents too. Yeah. Okay. Respect, I think it's a two-way thing. 
Okay, any other comments about what we've been saying about adolescence in the last few weeks? Yes. Have you found it helpful, insightful? Yes, Mark. It's just difficult um, knowing how to make a, a, a reasonable boundary and what to do if they actually cross that boundary. And it's interesting what you said about continuing to support them. But mm. say if they uh, secretly ran away and got married and something like that. I mean, there's still consequences to the actions, so it's knowing where the point of no, I mean, you're still supporting them, but the relationship has changed. So they potentially can't stay in their, their room like they used to come back and come back there. They've, they've, now, they've now made a commitment and they, they have to live with those consequences. Yeah, you know, my, my son did that. He, he went away and got married secretly. He waited two years before he told us. He's still happily married to her, by the way. He said, Dad, I'll take you out for a beer. I've got something to tell you. <laughs> he told me. I don't know whether to strangle him or congratulate him. He, but they hadn't told anyone, not just us. I felt a lot better after I heard that. It wasn't just us. Hadn't told her family, told any of their friends. I got, him, I got him to show me the marriage license and took a photograph of it and put it on the wall. <laughs> so I don't have a wedding picture, but I've got this. <laughs> so, you know, we were able to make a bit of a fun thing. You know, I think this is all really good insight. Um, it's just the more you read about raising kids, and especially like teenagers, it's just like spending a lot of time talking, I must Heaps of time talking, which is kind of like, wow. <laughs> You know, you, yeah, it's just realising more and more that it's time talking to people face to face and listen, well, listening really. And, but we're so busy, eh? We just have so much stuff that we're supposed to, or people think we should do what we need to do, and it's, we need to just tear it all out, man. We really got to prune it out. So just, yeah, just, sorry, Mark, just coming back to Mark, what you said, you, you, you set boundaries. And you, you, you allow some flex on those boundaries with adolescence. Uh, but at the end of the day, you, 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 you expect that they're going to cross over those boundaries at some point and in some way. Um, and it, it's, see, it's not the crossing over the boundary that's the big deal. The big deal is that you've set the boundary, and they respect you for that, and you continue to support them when they cross over it. And, and the crossing over it becomes grist for a conversation rather than a reason for a, um, a disciplinary clampdown. And, and so when you set the boundary, you're actually setting yourself up for further conversation with the adolescent down the track to find out what's going on in their heart that they crossed over. Yeah. As there may be something the parent needs to uh, backtrack on. Yeah, I've kind of seen... It tem it's tempting to make ultimatums whether you're the adolescent or whether you're the other one. You know? It's like, it's this way or else this drastic thing is going to happen, I'm going to do this. And parents do that too, but that's totally the wrong way because either they'll give up hope and just submit the inside of you or else they'll call your bluff and then what, then what do you do? Like, you don't so know where to go. It's that whole thing, that, like you mm -hmm. said, the boundary has to be, if, it's, if they cross their consequences, but you're still going to talk. You're not going to stop that. But with ultimatums, it's kind of like all over if you go and do that. And you see that a lot. So the, the, the big issue is not, you better not cross this boundary. The big issue is, for you as the parent, if I cross this boundary, how am I going to keep the relationship going in good ways? And still, you know, framework and friendship. Here's the boundary, and if you cross this boundary, you can't live in this house anymore. Okay. Are you asking me if that's a good thing to say? Yeah, well, it just seems to me that um, that's your, your authority is what goes on in the house, and how it affects the people in the house. It's, it seems to be hard to see this part of the authority of the So if you say that, then you've made it all about the boundary, haven't you? 
and you're prepared to sacrifice the relationship for the sake of the boundary. You know, you can't live in this house anymore. That's the sacrifice of the relationship. And you've, you've lost the opportunity to walk with them through the transition. But if they've gone up and married someone else? Oh, that's pretty drastic. Not, not too many people do that. But yeah, they've, 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 they've stepped outside of the family circle, haven't they? Hmm. Yeah. They've started their own. Yeah. They've started their own family circle. Yep. So how, you, how is this circle then going to relate to this circle? Sitting down with us one time, all well, us older ones, and saying, No matter what, like if you were to get pregnant, or like I would still be your mother, and I'd still be there for you, and I'd still want to talk to you. And I just remember that so powerfully impacted me because I knew that would be her worst nightmare. Like she didn't want us, you know, doing that, but yet that she loved us and that she loved us enough that even if we did, she'd still want to give us a hug and walk us through it, and it, that really impacted me and made me all the more want to, you know, do what she said or whatever, or be good, but, yeah. And how old were you then? I don't know, I was probably just like 14 or something. Mm, that's a wonderful story. So, do you want to say anything more about that, Mark? Um, I think uh, it might be a time for an older man, but most people go there way too quick, way too fast. Like, I mean, they jump to make an older man way before they've ever talked anywhere near him. Well, I, yeah, I, I, I don't see any room for uh, any need for older matrons or adolescents. See, back here, yes, but this is a transition. You know, I mean, they're moving in this direction. They're not moving back in this direction. An ultimatum is an effort to force them back here, but they're moving this way. Okay, I'm just going to... Uh, next week is the exam. So I want to hand out the exam paper. I love the doing this. I love doing this. <laughs> See the shock on their faces. Oh, sorry. Now, the reason I've given you that is to help you prepare for the exam. That's it. Ten questions, no multi-choice. You've got to answer all of them. And, and what I want you to do is use this exam paper to prepare model answers during the week. Now, don't, don't bring this. Don't bring this to class next week. I'll have some fresh ones for you. Leave this at home. Leave all your notes at home. Leave all your model answers at home. <laughs> and just come and hit it and uh, trust the Holy Spirit to bring to your remembrance all that you've studied and more. So that'll be uh, next, um, next Thursday and also to hand in your paper next Thursday at the same time. Uh, the term paper and the, uh, the exam and you'll see there at the top I'm going to ask you to tell me the... Um, percentage of reading and burger that you've completed. Um, now you, you may have read some or all of Hightower and I've, um, I'm not going to ask you about Hightower until the end of next term. So you've got two terms to read Hightower. Uh, but the burger reading, uh, parts one to five, is what I'm going to ask you about. So now you'll see down there that, that I'm going to want you to be able to know these diagrams and reproduce these diagrams for me and explain the terms and what they mean. You'll see that in questions 6, 7, 8, 9. Um, the, uh, um, the way I've set it up is that you can uh, spend 12 minutes answering each question and you know try to time yourself. Uh, just to remind you again that most of your marks are gained in the first 8 minutes of the 12 minutes. Uh, in minutes uh, 9, 10, 11 and 12 you don't get many marks. They're all at the front end. So uh, they kind of taper off quite quickly. So don't be tempted to write more than 12 minutes. After 12 minutes it's mainly repeating yourself and grasping in the air for whatever. Uh, move on to the next question because as you hit the next question you're going to zoom up again in terms of marks. The first five or eight minutes of the 12 minute question is where all the marks will be. Uh, but pr if you've done an outstanding job preparing for the exam, you can give me 12 minutes of meaty, powerful, in-depth stuff. 
That would be wonderful. Okay? Any questions about that? So, uh, next week's the exam. The next class is October 11. So, Hans, we won't need to see you till October 11. And um, then we're just going to spend next term um, going through the rest of this. Okay? Any questions, concerns? Wonderful. We'll have a great week preparing. Pure joy to go back over this material. Oh, those are those books there. One on adolescence, one on children. That'd be the last time you see them. Unless you buy one. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for adolescence. We thank you that you have uh, you have set it up so that we will grow to maturity and we thank you for the transition that you bring to us during that adolescent period. We thank you for the years of relative stability prior to ad ad adolescence which gives us the opportunity as families to become strong and deep in the things of Christ so that we can weather the transitions that are up ahead. We thank you for that mercy. and. And uh, Lord, as we look back over our own experience of adolescence, there's things there that um, perhaps we're regretful about. And yet, Lord, we know that we can bring all those things to you, to the throne of grace, and we can even now confess the sins of adolescence to you and know your forgiveness, know your freedom from guilt and shame. And uh, we can also go back to our parents, if necessary, and, and apologize to them also. It's never too late to be reconciled in the gospel. And we thank you that in your grace you continue to hold open those avenues of, of freedom and forgiveness for us. And Father, we, uh, we also ask that uh, as we continue to relate to people within the church and we're surrounded by young people and people on their way to adolescence, people going through adolescence, parents with adolescence, we ask, Lord, that you would give us increasing wisdom to be able to speak into their lives in ways that that draw them and their adolescents and their family closer to the Lord Jesus Christ and, and see his love manifest in their lives. We thank you for these glorious opportunities. We thank you for your promise that you will not let us fall, but you will present us with glorious joy before your presence without spot and blemish. And we look forward to that day when all our glory will be the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.